Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to, uh, to, to be a professor for a little while. I wouldn't want to overdo it. <laughs> I used to be a professor, but uh, a number of years have elapsed since then, and so this is a challenge for me to uh, come into a classroom uh, twice a day and uh, present an organized uh, talk, but I'll uh, do my best. and. Uh, maybe some of my rusty pedagogical skills will, will work a little better as we go along. I hope so. Uh, today, I want to uh, uh, present some uh, background material, as it were, uh, not so much actual historical material, which I'll be working with uh, for the rest of the week, although I will uh, make references from time to time to uh, historical events, but I want to uh, give us some uh, ways of uh, thinking that I have found helpful in uh, trying to understand the growth of government uh, in American history. And uh, so some of this is uh, more analytical uh, than it is historical, but I hope it will prove to be helpful uh, before I begin even that, I want to uh, uh, refer to some of the reading material that uh, was uh, recommended. Uh, my book, Crisis and Leviathan, was, uh, I think, uh, recommended to you as good background reading, and, and uh, you won't be surprised if you find me this week repeating some of uh, what I, I wrote in this book. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't learned everything new since I, I wrote this book. Uh, I wouldn't write it the same way today if I had it to do again, but uh, most, of the, uh, most of the things I would uh, rework are in the early chapters rather than the, uh, the meat of the book in the historical chapters. So for the most part, I stand by the historical analysis that appears in Crisis and Leviathan. Uh, when I wrote Crisis and Leviathan, about the only book that took a broad view of the growth of American government was uh, J.R.T. Hughes' book, uh, The Governmental Habit. And uh, that was a useful book, and, and it's still worth a uh, while for you to read, so uh, I recommend it. Although uh, Jonathan, who was a dear friend of mine, was not a very systematic thinker. And so what you look for when you read his book is... Uh, is nuggets of insight uh, and interesting facts, and there are many of them in his work, and that's what makes it worthwhile. But uh, Jonathan was not a man given to, to uh, developing a, a, a coherent uh, theory or structure uh, to encapsulate his interpretations, and uh, the work suffers as a result. Just recently, uh, two books uh, that also take uh, in a lot of territory have been published. Uh, some of you are aware of them, but just in case you're not, I want to call them to your attention. One of them is uh, Randy Holcomb's book, From Liberty to Democracy. Uh, Professor Holcomb is, uh, is well known to uh, uh, friends of the Mises Institute because he, he often comes here for for uh, talks and uh, conventions and other occasions. And uh, th this book uh, covers the whole time period from the uh, colonial uh, era of uh, British North America up to the present day and uh, carries uh, a theme uh, that, uh, that uh, in the beginning, at least uh, from the time of the Revolution and the Constitution, uh, there was a great emphasis placed by Americans on using government to secure liberty. Uh, and uh, democracy, on the other hand, was uh, something that was not held in great esteem and was viewed as a, 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 as an, a useful uh, and legitimate means to an end, but the end was the securing of liberty. Uh, and Holcomb argues that over the past 200 years, uh, the inexorable trend has been uh, away from that initial stance and toward uh, the idea that uh, the securing of, of liberty was relatively unimportant and uh, the uh, giving sway to more and more democracy. 
uh, was held in ever higher esteem. And uh, as a result, government has, has grown bigger and bigger. Uh, this book uh, is a nice complement to my book, Crisis and Leviathan, because whereas uh, I, I covered the period from the late 19th century to the to the late 20th century and focused on uh, national emergency periods, which I think played an especially important part in the course of events, uh, Holcomb tends to not only take in uh, a longer period, but to concentrate on, on, on as it were, non-emergency uh, periods and uh, events. And so uh, his book, along with mine, I think, uh, cover much of the ground that, uh, that one would want to learn about in trying to understand the growth of government in the United States. Another book I highly recommend uh, by Charlotte Twight uh, is, is called Dependent on DC, and the subtitle is The Rise of Federal Control Over the Lives of Ordinary Americans. Uh, Charlotte uh, was a, a PhD student of mine, if, if, if I may say so, uh, back uh, in the days when I was a professor at the University of Washington, uh, and, and I'm a little hesitant to describe Charlotte that way because uh, she was uh, a, a student who required no oversight. Uh, <laughs> uh, I love those kinds of students. Uh, uh, she, she knew what she wanted to do and how to do it, and she really didn't require much help from me, and although I tried to be helpful, when she wrote her dissertation, I, I don't think she needed me. Um, but uh, I was still pleased to be associated with her, her work. And uh, she became a dear friend of mine. And she and I have, have worked together over the years uh, on research of our own. We've, uh, we've done some writing, uh, especially uh, back in the 1980s when she was first uh, starting as a professor. Uh, but Charlotte's book uh, is, is beautifully researched. Uh, she's an extremely solid researcher, uh, always gets her facts absolutely straight and documents them uh, in, the, in, the, in the slightest detail. <laughs> so uh, I, I think some of us suffer from, from going off half-cocked sometimes and making factual claims that uh, really aren't well uh, documented. But Charlotte is not such a researcher. Uh, her book basically covers various uh, federal programs from the, the 1930s to the present and covers some ground that is normally not covered in discussions of the growth of government, such as the, the growth of the surveillance state, which has become more and more important, especially in the last couple of years, but has been something that's been developing for a long time. And so I highly recommend her book for the more recent period of the growth of government, and especially for programs like federal involvement in education and social security, uh, where, as the subtitle suggests, ordinary people have become more and more dependent uh, uh, on the federal government to provide them with, with critical benefits uh, that they used to provide through private means. So those are good uh, background sources, and, uh, and uh, I'm sure that I, I haven't yet absorbed everything that uh, is in them, and that I'll be going back to them from time to time. Let me say just a few words about uh, uh, history in general. Uh, if you were here last week to hear Ralph Rako, you, you probably don't need this, uh, but at all events, uh, this is the Mises Institute, which is uh, dedicated to advancing uh, the work of, uh, of Mises and, and Rothbard and, and others who work in that tradition. And uh, that is fundamentally a tradition in, in economic theory, or more basic than that even, in the theory of human action, in praxeology. Uh, I don't know if it was Mises himself or one of his followers who, who, who is supposed to have said that he, Everything you need to know, you can know by sitting in an armchair with your eyes closed. Uh, <laughs> and that's one way to, uh, to conceptualize the character of praxeology, that praxeology is the logic of action. And uh, once you uh, start thinking about uh, the idea of purposive, uh, goal-seeking human uh, behavior, then uh, 
uh, then you can sit there with your eyes closed and, and think of implications of that. Uh, throw in some reasonable factual uh, auxiliary statements and then see what they, along with the uh, axiom of human action, imply. And you can spin out an enormous uh, multitude of implications that way and build a whole structure. And uh, uh, to a large extent, that's what Mises did in, in his great work, Human Action. And uh, others have followed and developed new implications over the years. So, so one might say, well, if, if we can know everything by, by sitting in a chair with our eyes closed, why do all this hard work of learning history? Uh, that, that requires that we open our eyes, that, that we do an, a great deal of reading and wrestling with facts and trying to sort out alternative interpretations of specific events. Uh, it's a very different enterprise from uh, sitting with our arm, with our eyes closed, uh, thinking. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, easier or harder, it's just very different. Uh, well, I, I think Mises himself anticipated uh, that kind of uh, question, uh, and it's interesting, it's always been interesting to me that that Mises devoted so much of his own intellectual energies to actually doing history. Mises was, I think, a great historian, uh, and uh, many of his works uh, display his, uh, his uh, skills uh, and wisdom as a historian. A lot of judgment goes into historical interpretation, and that's where many historians go astray, uh, because they, they're not good at making sound judgments. But Mises, I believe, was, uh, was an extremely good uh, judge uh, when he interpreted historical events. And uh, some of his works, such as Nation, State, and Economy, are, to my way of thinking, splendid works of historical scholarship. Uh, similarly, uh, Murray Rothbard devoted uh, much of his energy to historical scholarship. And, uh, I think I'm willing to say that nobody knew more facts than Murray. <laughs> Probably no human being ever read more books and remembered what he read. It was uh, amazing uh, what the man could call forth uh, with, with, with almost no prompting at all. Uh, I actually wrote in, in a memoir after Murray died uh, how he, he, he wrote a letter to me one time after I had drafted uh, my book, Crisis and Leviathan. It was being circulated to scholars, and uh, Murray turned out to be one of those persons. And uh, he responded by writing a, a letter, which was, was basically to me, although it was sent to, to the Pacific Research Institute, which was sponsoring my book, uh, and passed along to me. But uh, this was a 20-page, single-spaced letter uh, which consisted basically of, uh, of uh, recommendations for, for reading. <laughs> he would say, well, Professor Higgs has slumbered at this point. <laughs> he, uh, he needs to see, and then he would have some reference to the Southwestern Tennessee Academy of Religious and Praxeological Studies, uh, where I could have found the article by Joe Schmo. Uh, on, on, on something I never heard of. So uh, Murray uh, was an extraordinary historian, and uh, I don't think any of us can really expect to, to equal him in that regard because uh, it requires some genetic equipment that uh, I, I suspect the rest of us are lacking. But, uh, but at all events, uh, he also did a lot of hard work, even with the skills he brought to the endeavor to, to to learn history, and he absorbed a huge amount of it and wrote a great deal of interpretive historical work. And it's, uh, besides being educational, it's great fun because Murray was a sprightly writer, if, if anything. We hear every day uh, on the news and uh, when we read the newspapers, various people engaged in, in politics making policy proposals. And if you think about it, I believe you'll find that policy proposals invariably rest on some assumptions about how the world works. Uh, some of them are, are what we might call praxeological assumptions. Uh, it's remarkable how many 
po policy seem to rest on, on misunderstanding the law of demand, for example, uh, thinking little things like that. But uh, very often they're a little more complicated and basically make assumptions about, about uh, uh, how people will respond to various stimuli, for example. Uh, a few months back, uh, Paul Wolfowitz told us that as soon as, uh, as, soon as American forces entered uh, Iraq, the Iraqis would come forth waving and throwing flowers and celebrate us for liberating them. Well, uh, Mr. Wolfowitz was making a judgment about how the world works, uh, assuming he was not being disingenuous in making that forecast. Uh, he believed uh, that there was a certain relationship between some fairly complex events. Uh, and on the basis uh, of his understanding of how these events are interrelated in, in concrete reality, he made a forecast about what would happen if something was changed, uh, if the government of Iraq was replaced by American military forces. Uh, well, now we see, I believe, uh, that he was wrong, that in fact uh, uh, there wasn't a a lot of throwing of flowers on American troops, and, and, and indeed, uh, rocket-propelled grenades are closer to, to the mark, and they're being thrown daily now uh, at these unfortunate American soldiers who sh put themselves in harm's way and are discovering uh, how people feel about it. But all policy uh, proposals rest on judgments and understandings about how the world works. Where do these judgments come from? Well, they come from people's understanding of history. Uh, people say, we can't do such and such because we know from what happened at Munich in 1938 that if we let that happen, the next thing you know, uh, Saddam Hussein's forces will be rolling into Czechoslovakia and then into the Bronx in Brooklyn. So people make judgments, and sometimes these particular historical events, like that one I just mentioned, the Munich analogy, turn out to loom extraordinarily large in a lot of people's thinking. Uh, much of American foreign policy seems premised on an understanding that the Munich analogy applies generally, always and everywhere. Uh, and uh, that may be an unsound interpretation of history. So uh, a good understanding of history might help us uh, to be better judges of policy proposals. Uh, history is, among other things, what you might call the laboratory of social science. Uh, we don't have to have a laboratory to te test our praxeological knowledge. As Mises said, we can, we can get that straight by sitting in the chair with the eyes closed. We know what purposive action is because we are all engaged in it ourselves as human beings, and we can use logic to, to arrive at some implications of, of human action. But, uh, but for more complex events and how they are interrelated in the world, we can't just rely on praxeological understanding. We have to add what Mises called a, Thymology, and thymological understanding is, is the kind that uh, combines uh, our praxeological understanding with uh, our knowledge of what people are actually trying to do. What do they know? What do they believe? What are they trying to achieve? What do they regard as good means for the attainment of the ends they've selected? Uh, these things are not given in general. They vary according to time and place. And, and uh, for that reason, uh, history is the only place we can go to find out the specifics. Uh, uh, even praxeological knowledge doesn't tell us magnitudes. It's one thing to say the law of demand applies, uh, so that we, we, we believe that if a price is higher than other things being equal, people want to consume less of the good. But how much less? Only history tells us uh, about the magnitudes. 
so history is where uh, social scientists have to go uh, to, to, to put empirical meat on the praxeological bones of their understanding. Uh, a lot of philosophers of history and historians have believed over the centuries that uh, we could arrive at laws of history just as, uh, say, physicists have arrived at laws of physics, laws of nature. Uh, we know that uh, in, in a vacuum, uh, uh, objects fall at 32 feet per second per second. Okay? That's, a, that's a law. We believe that applies to any object in any vacuum whatsoever. It's a general law. Uh, and people have dreamed, uh, people such as Karl Marx, uh, that they could somehow uh, <clears throat> divine the laws of history, the kind of uh, rate of acceleration of, of capitalism, as it were, uh, and what it was going to uh, become at some future time and why. Uh, what uh, Mises taught uh, uh, in various places, including his wonderful book, Theory and History, was that uh, there are no laws of history, and there can't be any, uh, because laws of history would contradict the whole idea of human action, the idea that people are free to make choices, that they're not predetermined, that nothing ever requires any individual to choose a particular choice in a given situation. Uh, people learn, uh, they acquire new tastes, new objectives, they discover new means to achieve their, uh, their given objectives. Uh, they're constantly changing. Uh, uh, every day you live, you, you step, as it were, into a new river. Uh, it's never the same again, because you're never the same again. You become a new human being every day, although there's a certain core of continuity, we hope. Uh, so. There can't be any laws of history, and, and some would, might say, if there can't be any laws of history, what's the point? Why are you doing all this hard work of historical research if you're not going to arrive at some kind of generalized uh, knowledge, some kind of statement about how the world works in, in uh, time? Uh, and the answer is that uh, e even if we can't have laws of history, uh, we can discover uh, some pretty good patterns uh, and uh, some pretty reliable regularities. That doesn't mean they're surefire. That doesn't mean we can be absolutely certain that they'll happen in precisely the way that they've happened in history. But we don't have any choice as human beings about making bets, whether we're making interpretive bets as scholars about why things happened as they did, or whether we're making bets as ordinary human beings going through life uh, in, in a perfectly routine way. We all rely on things hanging together in a certain way in order to take the next step. If we couldn't have some kind of reliance, then, uh, then we'd go mad. Uh, but we, we ordinarily uh, develop those kinds of uh, confidences. Uh, we, we know that certain things are, are good bets and we rely on them, and we succeed as a result in achieving the ends we, we seek. Uh, and it's that way with the study of history, too. We can't be absolutely certain that any of the regularities and patterns we discover uh, are, 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 first of all, correct, necessarily. Uh, there's always judgment involved there. And we can't, uh, uh, we can't be absolutely certain that they're going to recur. Uh, but uh, we can have a degree of confidence. We can make a bet. Now, many historians uh, talk uh, it, as a shorthand, it, if in no other way, as if society uh, did things. And I just want to caution us as we go forward that, that even I may sometimes refer to, to things that uh, people in general believed or did uh, as if society were an actor, uh, but uh, th this can never be more than a shorthand, a way of, uh, of compressing uh, our discourse, because uh, we, know, we know from our understanding of human action and praxeology that only individuals are capable of taking purposive actions. Uh, 
Society is an abstraction. Uh, it's a concept. It's not an acting entity. And so uh, we, we, we need to be alert to historical judgments that, that uh, are expressed in the form of society needing something and therefore doing something, uh, society deciding on such and such. Uh, historical writing is rampant with this kind of sloppy language, and I think it very often reflects sloppy thinking, sad to say doesn't mean that the individual actors in history are atoms. <laughs> this is an old canard that uh, anti-libertarians often throw at libertarians. That you, you assume everybody's an island, uh, an atom, that everybody's on his own. Uh, what a preposterous idea. Well, indeed, it is a preposterous idea because we all live in society. And we're all influenced by our location in that society, by our interactions with other people. That's how we acquire our beliefs, our knowledge, our understandings of the social world, and all the rest of it. So we're not atoms, and we're never going to be. Uh, but that doesn't mean that some abstraction, such as society, is an actor. Ultimately, all the actions are still being taken by individuals, no matter how embedded they are in a social context. So when we think of, uh, of ideas, for example, and we're going to be talking a good deal about the role of ideas in, in history the rest of the week, uh, these are ideas held in individual minds, uh, and they have something to do with the social reality in which the, the individuals uh, exist and hold those ideas. And in turn, when individuals express themselves and take actions, they alter to some extent the social reality they are a part of. So there's a constant uh, reciprocal relationship between individuals and their ideas and the social reality that they, uh, in a sense, uh, emerge from and in turn help to recreate. So there's a constant going back and forth. Uh, some historians have tried to argue almost as if ideas were the deciding force in, in, in determining the course of history. Others that, no, it's just social reality. It's just big forces. It's things like industrialization or urbanization. Uh, individuals just react. Uh, they don't have anything to do. It doesn't matter what they think. Well, these, these views are both wrong. Uh, because, in fact, uh, both, both kinds of changes are, are taking place, uh, and out of their interplay comes historical change. Well, we're going to be talking this week about a particular form of historical change, the so-called growth of government uh, in, in just uh, the United States and the area that... Uh, that was the British North American colonies before it became the United States of America. Uh, so this is a little, little slice of, uh, of historical space, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's big enough, uh, for me at least, uh, there's, there's uh, a lot to be learned here. Uh, let's start off by clarifying what we mean by the size of government, and therefore how we can talk about the growth of government. This is this is not an easy thing to do right at the outset. Uh, it, there have been many studies, uh, particularly in the past 30 years, uh, of the growth of government. Economists became very interested for, for a while, uh, and then political scientists uh, got involved, and others uh, joined the, uh, the hunt to try to explain the growth of government. Uh, and, uh, Modern social science being what it is uh, in the mainstream, uh, this quickly uh, became a, a, a gigantic econometrics exercise in which you know, my, my econometrics was cleverer than yours. <laughs> that's, that, that's how economists make their uh, reputations in the mainstream profession. Uh, and so, unfortunately, although though these studies actually got off to some promising beginnings, uh, they tended to 
to go astray in various ways because uh, they, they turned into the usual uh, mishmash, a swamp of econometric quarreling. Uh, and along the way, uh, the analysts tended to lose sight of what the hell they were supposed to be understanding. Uh, and so we, we need to recall, unlike these econometricians, that there is no one single way to measure the size of, uh, of government. That Most of them seized upon government spending uh, as a proportion of gross domestic product. And that was the size of government, and that became a measurable dependent variable to do the econometrics. Now, in some cases, they, they used uh, alternative measures, such as uh, government revenues relative to gross domestic product. Uh, in a few cases, they looked at employment, and they looked at government employment relative to total employment or total labor force. Uh, now, you notice that whenever they've, they, they've tried to measure the growth of government, they've almost always uh, use some relative measure. That is to say, they've standardized what government is doing, how much it spends or taxes or employs, relative to some uh, broader uh, measure, such as total domestic product or uh, total employment. Uh, this, this, this right away, in a sense, uh, begs the question, because if, for example, you had a growing economy, such as, such as the modern Western economies, which tend to grow at, at around 2 to 4% a year in terms of GDP uh, routinely, uh, and government grew at the same rate, then according to these relative measures, there would be no growth of government. You know, if you had 3% growth of GDP and 3% growth of government, uh, then then 26 years later, you'd say government has not grown, even though it would be spending twice as much money. <laughs> now, this makes sense to economists because they, they think somehow that, well, uh, government ought to grow uh, implicitly. <laughs> uh, if, if the economy's getting bigger, well, sure, government's got to get bigger, too. Well, why is it that if General Mills produces more cornflakes, government has to spend more money? That doesn't really make a lot of sense. Why is it if, if, if the mom and pop shop on the corner hires another kid to serve up, serve up uh, hamburgers, that government employment needs to go up? These relative measures have built into them a kind of bias against even recognizing the growth of government. Uh, so that's one shortcoming. But uh, the major shortcoming is that government, uh, as it takes place in modern uh, societies, uh, is so multidimensional that none of these measures uh, can hope to capture everything that government is doing. If, if for example, uh, the Supreme Court makes some ruling that cuts into the security of private property rights, well, government may be spending the same as before, may be employing the same as before. But it seems to me that that uh, denotes the growth of government. If government has in fact, put its decision-making in the place of decision-making by private individuals as property owners. And there are any number of ways in which government can substitute means that are not captured by spending or employment for means that are, and we'll miss those kinds of substitutions if all we do is keep our eyes focused on these simple measures of the size and growth of government. So we, we cannot trust them. The typical device of the econometricians is to say, well, I assume 
They'll say, well, I'm not so obtuse as to believe that these capture everything government does, but I assume that all the things that aren't captured are correlated closely with the things that are. Well, show me. <laughs> That's a nice assumption, but it, does it have any basis? Can we, in fact, easily find instances in which there's not a close correlation? And I believe we can indeed, uh, that uh, government is so multidimensional that it's very hard to um, uh, describe as uh, some kind of simple index that can be quantitatively measured. In addition, the modern governments, such as uh, those in the United States, uh, are multiple entities. Uh, we have, of course, a federal system in, in this country, so we have a central government usually called the federal government. And then we have 50 states, each with a big government of its own. And within the states, we have thousands of counties, about 3,000 of them in the country altogether. Each of them has a government. And within the counties, there are subunits. In some cases, there are units such as townships uh, that have little government uh, functions uh, of their own. And then we have a hybrid entities like port authorities and drainage districts and on and on and on. We have any number of, of organizations that are governmental in the sense that they make rules that are mandatory and are backed by force and, and they impose taxes. Uh, in the United States in recent years, there, there are more than 80,000 separate governmental entities operating, 80,000. Uh, and more than 60,000 of them uh, have the power to tax. So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's a lot of different governments. Now, it's true that uh, no given individual, uh, thank goodness, is subject to every one of them. Uh, we might be you know, pulled into oblivion uh, by all the competing forces to, to get at our, our substance. <laughs> But, uh, but even uh, though no individual is subject to every one of them, uh, many individuals are, are subject to a, a whole bunch of them. And so when we talk about the government, that in itself is a kind of stylistic compression that begs a whole lot of questions. Now again, uh, we might assume, and some people do, that they're basically all in cahoots. <laughs> Now we can talk about the government because all these people who, are, who are, 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 are plundering the private sector and living at its expense all agree what they want to do. They all want to grow and get more of our money and, and exercise more power over us. Well, yes, yes, and no. <laughs> uh, because very often they, they actually find themselves competing with one another. Uh, we all are familiar, for example, with how uh, states are always uh, uh, quarreling with the federal government about who's going to regulate a certain activity or, or who's going to get to tax a certain activity or how the revenue from a tax is going to be divided between the states and sometimes the local governments and the federal government. And so we have this revenue sharing and we have uh, uh, so-called cooperatively administered programs, which are rampant in the past 60 years. Things like the unemployment insurance programs. Every state has one. Uh, they adopted them because otherwise the feds were going to keep all 3% of the employment tax. But if they adopted a, a, a satisfactory <laughs> state plan, then the federal government would remit 90% of that tax to the states. So having their arms twisted in that fashion was enough. And they, they all agreed to have a state unemployment insurance program back in the 1930s. Uh, but again, subject to federal rules and subject to federal financing. And, and the sharing of revenue. And so government in the United States is a very complex, uh, sometimes uh, conspiratorial, sometimes competitive across these different enti entities. And it just makes life diabolically complicated. 
for people trying to understand what's going on sometimes. Well, suppose, just to get us off the ground, uh, we consider some of these standard measures of the size uh, of government and look at how they've changed over time uh, so that we can get at least uh, uh, some point of departure uh, for understanding the magnitudes that are involved. Uh, suppose we took this measure of government spending for goods and services as a proportion of the gross domestic product. That's probably the most common way to measure the size of government. Uh, that's the measure you can easily get uh, out of the national income and product uh, accounts data because the government spending for goods and services is, is a component of GDP, final goods and services. If we go back to 1900, say, we'd find that uh, governments at all levels in the United States uh, spend an amount of money equal to about 6% of GDP to purchase <coughs> final goods and services, 6%. Hmm? And if we follow that over time, it has ups and downs. Some of the ups are quite big. Uh, this chart shows just federal spending, uh, and not just for final goods and services, but for everything, including transfers. Uh, but as you can see, in the past, back here in the, uh, I can also uh, see that there's a, that's 1860, it looks like 1880. Uh, you see the big uh, peak of uh, spending at the time of the Civil War. Uh, but then it falls way back down, doesn't quite go back to where it had been before the Civil War, of course. Uh, there's no going back. Uh, uh, but then it trends down for a long time until the next uh, spire during World War I jumps up again, uh, falls back, but not all the way. And then there's a, another uh, peak in the early 1930s with the collapse basically <laughs> Uh, not because government spent more, but because GDP collapsed and government didn't spend less. So mm -hmm. there's a little peak here. Uh, and then we have this gigantic peak during World War II uh, when the whole economy was semi-collectivized uh, for a few years. Uh, but that falls back. Not all the way, of course. Uh, and then we have this kind of... Uh, upward trend here, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's the next measure I was going to tell you about. If we went back to 1900 and looked not just at government spending for currently uh, produced goods and services, but at all spending, we throw in the transfers, the pensions and what have you. In 1900, that was 7% of GDP. Now notice, we only added one percentage point when we went from government purchases of goods and services to all government spending back in 1900. We went from 6% to 7% as the, our measure of the size of government. And that's because government didn't make many transfer payments in 1900. Uh, it, the bulk of them were, at that time, uh, transfers to veterans of the Civil War, and, and, all, and many of them were already dead by 1900, so the payments were actually going to their their survivors, uh, their, their wives and uh, children and, and uh, third cousins twice removed. And the uh, federal government had made uh, veterans' pensions a boondoggle in the late 19th century. So it reached the point where even guys who had deserted from the Union Army were awarded pensions <laughs> for their service in the war. Uh, if you understand politics, you, you understand that. <laughs> so uh, transfers didn't amount to much, but if we come up to the present, uh, the uh, government spending of all kinds, uh, that chart shows just the federal, but if we throw in all kinds, we, we get to uh, somewhere between 35 and 40% now of GDP 
government spending of all sorts relative to GDP. So that's a much bigger increase than the first measure gave us, about twice as much. Uh, and that reflects the fact that, that since World War II, uh, government purchases of final goods and services have grown only at about the same rate as GDP, but these transfers have grown much faster. And so they, they've become the, the, uh, the giant gorilla that's eating Manhattan and Chicago and Minneapolis and all the rest of the places in this country. Uh, Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid, goes on and on and on. The uh, transfer programs are like the stars of the heavens. Uh, and of course now we're, uh, we're getting even a new one, a giant, very expensive one for prescription uh, payments that uh, is going to buy a few votes, uh, the politicians think, uh, in the next election. Uh, and, and this one, uh, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to forecast, will be just like Medicare. When Medicare was put into effect back in the 1960s, they forecasted what it would cost. And within about 12 days, the forecast had been falsified, and it turned out to be vastly more expensive than forecasted, and it just got worse and worse over time. Uh, and the same thing will be true of these prescription medicines. In fact, the British have already been through this. I, I lived in Britain about 30 years ago for a while and discovered that their National Health Service had made prescriptions free when it was begun <clears throat> back in the late 1940s. And as a result, what do you know? Uh, people were, were camping out at the pharmacies, demanding medicine for everything they could think of and getting it free. Uh, and the cost went through the roof. And uh, the British finally, even the British uh, decided they couldn't tolerate that. And so <laughs> when I lived there, they, their, their means of dealing with it was to put it charge on a 50 pence, you know, half, half a pound sterling, uh, that had to be paid by the patient when a prescription was filled. Uh, that was a very nominal charge, but uh, the, the 50 pence charge had re resulted in a fallback of something like 50 percent in the number of prescriptions people were demanding at the pharmacy. So it's very clear that the marginal value people placed on the prescriptions they were getting before had been very small indeed. And uh, that's, uh, that, that's how these things work. <coughs> Government employment back in 1900 was about 4 percent of all employment. Uh, who were these people? Mostly postal workers. <laughs> uh, over half of them were postal workers, and most of the others were school teachers. Uh, of course, people were working for government in all sorts of capacities in 1900, but they just didn't add up to very much compared to total employment, 4%. Uh, when we get to the present, it's about 17%. And that's a great understatement because many of the people who are categorized nowadays as private employees uh, are, uh, in fact, in every way except formally being on the government payroll, government employees. Uh, some of them uh, get paid entirely out of federal grants or they work as consultants uh, they work in all kinds of projects, such as uh, producing uh, military goods and services, where they're categorized as private, but uh, the only reason they're doing what they do is because government is paying for it and directing how it will be done. So 17% is a, a gross understatement of actual employment uh, by government now. Uh, and indeed, I, I have argued that uh, because of the uh, requirements placed on all of us nowadays to uh, do tax accounting, to do regulatory compliance in a host of ways, uh, all of these things dictated by government, uh, but uh, without any pay for us to carry out the demands, uh, we are in fact all working for government. <coughs> Uh, to some extent, 
uh, we're just not even getting paid. We're paying for the privilege, as it were. Well, let's uh, take a quick look at some of the theories that have been advanced to explain the growth of government uh, in the United States and elsewhere. I'll be coming back in uh, the next few days to, to these ideas uh, uh, repeatedly, so I won't dwell on them right now. One of the uh, commonest uh, ideas, uh, particularly among uh, historians, <coughs> Uh, it's what I call the modernization hypothesis. The idea that uh, as uh, economies uh, uh, develop, uh, as they uh, industrialize and urbanize and, and undergo all the various uh, changes in uh, social and economic structure that are associated with those kinds of uh, broad uh, uh, events, you just have to have more government. Uh, the idea that you could have horse and buggy government in a modern society is unthinkable to many people, including many historians. Uh, how could you have uh, a government like the one in 1900 where about all the government employees did was deliver the mail and, and, and teach the kids in the public schools uh, in a world with the internet? And, and uh, satellites and uh, cell phones. Like, uh, obviously, we have to have a lot more government uh, to keep things from flying apart. Well, uh, this, this has a lot of appeal to many people. Uh, not all of them, not all of them in, confined in asylums. Uh, <laughs> they're, uh, they're convinced that it's just unthinkable that you could have a modern economy uh, with a, a very small government. Look at all the things we wouldn't have. I mean, no agriculture department, no labor department, no commerce department, no, no SEC. Or, or Martha would be running amok. Uh, she'd, she'd be selling stock whenever she wanted to. Uh, so, you can't have this sort of thing. Things would just blow up. You have to have government to see uh, that, that uh, the complexities are managed. Uh, well, th this, of course, is a preposterous idea. Uh, uh, not only is it a bad idea, it's a backwards idea. Because, indeed, as many economists of the Austrian tradition have argued, probably Hayek at greatest length, the more complex the socioeconomic world becomes, the less capable of managing it government becomes. We might be able to imagine a government in a primitive tribal setting with no division of labor to speak of, and only a handful of people where tribal elders could keep an eye on everything and tell people what to do. But once we get far beyond that scale of social life, it's just not conceivable that government officials can know what's going on, understand what's going on, and somehow devise a superior way to make things happen. It, it, those kinds of beliefs entail what Hayek called the pretense of knowledge. Now, of course, modern thinking about government is, is full of the pretense of knowledge. And it's a pretense I'll be coming back to again and again this week. But the modernization hypothesis is a corollary of uh, the pretense of knowledge. We didn't have to have bigger government because we had big corporations and complex technology, anything of the sort. Now, <clears throat> mainstream economists have put a lot of effort into arguing that we had to have more government because the modernization entailed the uh, uh, complex of market failures. Market failures in neoclassical economics have to do with 
deviations between the, the makeup of the world and the makeup of the blackboard. Uh, neoclassical economics has a model, it writes on the blackboard, of how things would be if they were efficient. Uh, we had Pareto optimality. Every, every resource was being used in its most valued alternative. Uh, every consumer had adjusted his purchases so that he was in perfect equilibrium and he couldn't make any readjustment that would make him better off. No producer could switch methods of production and reduce the cost of production, blah, blah, blah. So we write all these conditions on a blackboard in, 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 in mathematical equations and we say, if we don't have all those kinds of conditions satisfied in the real world, the real world then has market failure. Well, that's sweet. You can do a lot of uh, blackboard work that way. But those blackboard models don't have much, if any, connection with the world we live in. Uh, they are, among other things, uh, another exercise in the pretense of knowledge. You presume you know everybody's demand function for every good. You presume you know every producer's production function for every good. You presume that the prices are all given to people, and they know them, and they adjust accordingly. Now, this is all a fantasy world. This has nothing to do with how reality operates. Uh, nonetheless, some of these inefficiencies, uh, things like uh, uh, spillovers, uh, negative externalities, uh, do have counterparts in reality. And, and so you can say, well, maybe there's something there anyhow. And say when a, when a factory spews smoke out and it spills over onto the neighbors and, and damages their property, well, that's a negative externality. It never contracted with them uh, to get their permission for that. And therefore, uh, uh, this is something that could be repaired, conceivably repaired by government action. They could... Uh, get a, a court order to stop this pollution, or they could, they could lay a tax on the activity of the factory, or a tax on the amount of emissions that spews forth, or uh, various things might be done to alter the situation so that uh, third parties wouldn't be uh, damaged by actions they hadn't agreed uh, to endure. Well, okay, life is full of third-party effects. There's no disputing that. It, every day I, I witness things that cause me grievous pain. Uh, the news, for example. Uh, uh, and, and, and if only something could be done to tax the people <laughs> who are spewing these things onto me, uh, I would feel better off. Uh, but we all feel that way <laughs> in, some, in some way. Uh, so, uh, if we go back and look at how much of the effort of government over time has taken uh, the form of, of programs or actions designed to internalize these harmful externalities, how much of it falls under that rubric? And the answer is not very much. Uh, of all the things that government does, uh, most of it has no plausible connection whatsoever with reining in harmful externalities. None. Huh? Medicare is not about externalities. Old age pensions are not about externalities. Buying military equipment, yeah, that's kind of about externalities, but you know, we can all hope we won't be the ones spilled onto by the uranium-coated 20 millimeter cannon bullets. Uh, but uh, this isn't a very good explanation. It doesn't even contribute very much to understanding the growth of government. To say government has to deal with inefficiencies uh, caused by negative externalities. Uh, other negative externalities, so-called, like, uh, like uh, lapses of competition, like the fact that we don't have a thousand producers of homogeneous goods in every industry, well, that's just preposterous, since, since these are inconceivable conditions in reality. To uh, indict reality for failing to mimic them uh, make, makes no sense whatsoever. The world is full of uh, 
heterogeneous goods, of uh, goods produced only by a few producers, uh, constantly changing the characteristics of their goods and the terms on which they offer them to consumers. Uh, of course, these people are, 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 are often, if not always, fiercely competitive in the sense of uh, being rivalrous with one another, but they're just not competitive in the blackboard neoclassical economics fashion. They're not price takers. Uh, they're price searchers. They're looking for price terms and other contractual terms that work best for them uh, given the constraints on them of consumers and the offers being made by alternative suppliers. Hmm? Public goods are supposed to create uh, market failures. These, uh, these goods that have the peculiar quality that uh, once they're produced, there's no marginal cost associated with anyone's being added to the class of users. Uh, now, some people dispute that public goods exist at all, that is, some Austrians. Uh, I can conceive, I think, of something that would satisfy the definition of a public good. It's usually something like a general rule. If government uh, says, uh, for example, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're going to make, make a rule that, that uh, to coordinate everybody's driving, you drive on the right-hand side of a, of a two-way street. Uh, that's a general rule. It's a public good. It's the same for everybody. Uh, presumably, we all benefit from adopting that rule. Not that we wouldn't have had the sense to do it without the government <laughs> making the rule, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, if government makes a rule that assists us in coordinating social life, and we can add more drivers, and new babies can be born into society, and they benefit from the coordination of of that rule's existence. That, 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 that's public good, I think. But, but true public goods are pretty few and far between. Uh, the classic example of neoclassical economists is always national defense. And that's really not a very good example. Uh, it might have been a better example to the extent, for example, that, that uh, defense deterred uh, a nuclear attack on the United States deterrence to the extent that it really existed and, and resulted from the National Defense Program uh, did indeed provide protection for everybody living within the United States and if new people were added <coughs> to the population they enjoyed that protection at no additional cost and so forth. So it's not, uh, it's not totally far-fetched but again how much of the growth of government uh, can be understood in terms of the provision of public goods uh, that we, we would all agree are public goods? If the label gets thrown around very freely, it's called education a public good, although it's not, it doesn't satisfy any of the criteria of being a public good. Uh, they call uh, pub, public health measures public goods, although <coughs> beyond a certain limit, you got to spend more money to provide sewerage service for more people, not like deterring nuclear attacks. And once you build a sewage system in Auburn, it's good for the whole country. Right? Right. So th th this uh, explanation of the growth of government doesn't cover much ground, even if we agree to cover some. Now, some people have... Uh, tried to, as it were, get a little more politically realistic. All of these uh, market failure explanations are bad, <clears throat> among other things, because uh, they, they involve a black box explanation. They say, there, well, there was an inefficiency, boom, government grew. Well, why? What was the incentive of any politician to do anything just because there was inefficiency out there in the world? How did that promote his end? Did that get him reelected? How did he know there was an inefficiency? These explanations are, are more like apologies or excuses for growth, growth of government than they are good historical uh, interpretations of why it actually grew. But recognizing that, that problem, uh, some analysts have 
have was seized on interest groups. And they said, well, interest groups uh, tried to use the power of government to promote their purposes, and that made government grow. Well, yeah, there's no disputing there are a lot of organized groups trying to use the power of government, so that, that has some promise. Uh, we might wonder why, why it was that they didn't get organized until the 20th century. Didn't, didn't interest groups want to use the power of government before? Uh, well, the truth is some did. So we still have to understand why this became so much more rampant in the past century than it was beforehand. Okay. But back there in the 19th century, when government was, at least by that measure, so small, I'll suggest tomorrow that it was really bigger than that. But, uh, it certainly is much bigger by any measure now than it used to be. Uh, what's happened to these interest rates? Did they just wake up and discover that they can use the power of government to promote their, their narrow interests? Uh, I doubt it. Some of the models have, have tried to work this in in various ways by talking about changes in the voting franchise or uh, other changes in the costs of uh, the taking collective action. And some of these models have some interest, but again, they're more like toys. Uh, they don't get us in terms of actually understanding who did what to make government get bigger over time. A number of people have, have advanced ideology uh, as an explanation, uh, and uh, this has been popular with people of various uh, political uh, philosophies, people as varied as, uh, as say, uh, Mises and Keynes uh, both believed that it was ideas uh, that had uh, led to the growth of government more than anything else. Keynes is often quoted from that uh, famous last chapter of his general theory, in which he says that, uh, uh, that it's, in the end, his ideas, it's uh, that uh, practicalities are greatly overrated, and I suppose as an intellectual himself, he was just trying to, uh, uh, to tell the world about how important people like him really were, uh, and, and unfortunately, there was more than germ of truth in what he was saying in his particular case, but uh, Hayek and Mises and Keynes all agreed that, uh, that if you can have the development of ideas which lead people to take actions making government grow uh, or shrink, uh, and that ideas are powerful ultimately. Uh, this goes way back. Uh, David Hume told us that all governments depend on public opinion. Uh, uh, Etienne de la Boite, uh said that the minute we stopped kowtowing to the tyrant, he would topple. Uh, many people have recognized that public opinion, uh, you know, what we might call the dominant ideology, props up whatever it is that government does. And if we just didn't acquiesce, uh, these things couldn't happen. Uh, so, Ideology uh, clearly is a potentially powerful explanatory factor, and, and, and uh, I don't dismiss it at all. Uh, I don't think it's the whole story, however. I think it has to be incorporated along with other things that have happened to, to make it operate as it has uh, in the past couple of centuries. And, of course, we need to attend to the particulars of the ideology. Things that, Things like socialism, uh, fascism, social democracy, these broad bodies of uh, belief systems uh, have a certain content that operates to, to make government bigger, uh, whereas alternative uh, ideologies, classical liberalism, uh, for example, tended to operate to restrain government and to confine it to a limited set of functions. Well, finally, there, there, there have been some, and I'm often accused of being one of them, who, who blame the growth of government on crises. Uh, and uh, again, this is an appealing idea because if, if one looks at any kind of standard measure of the growth of government, it, it does seem, seem that the connection with crisis is not exactly random. <laughs> it does seem to be a, a perfect match 
that uh, when there's a great social crisis, a big war, terrible business depression in modern times, and in fact, government does grow at an extraordinary pace. Uh, now, of course, some people don't like to incorporate crisis in the explanation because they say it's a transitory effect. Well, yeah, it grows during the crisis because it does all these emergency measures, but when the crisis is over, uh, then all those crisis measures uh, are given up, abandoned, lapse, uh, and uh, what really matters in the eyes of many analysts is uh, is the kind of underlying force, these broad forces that are producing some trend. Uh, I think that that kind of thinking uh, reifies the trend. It gives that trend a reality uh, that it doesn't possess. What makes that trend slope upward? Why is it that it's doing that? And would it continue to do that if there never were any crises? Well, I'll argue no. It might, it might grow a little bit, but certainly in the specific course of events that we've seen in the United States in the past uh, 150 years, uh, that upward trend has much to do with what happened during the crisis periods. And to treat those crises as transitory, kind of stochastic events, <coughs> random, just blips, now, forget them. Some analysts even leave the crisis years out of their time series. We don't want to contaminate our clean trends by uh, adding these uh, ab abnormal observations. Uh, I think it's extremely bad historical uh, analysis. And, and in fact, historians as such have not been as uh, liable to commit that mistake as the economists and the political scientists who think of themselves as so much more hard-headed and analytical. Uh, but this is, a, uh, this is a basic blunder of, of interpretation. Well, uh, why don't I stop my talking right now and let you ask questions. So we still have about 15 minutes left. And what I've tried to do is just give you a preview of some of the background uh, that uh, is relevant to the specifics that I'll get into in more detail uh, Tuesday through Friday. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, this afternoon about ideology uh, in particular. So, uh, your comments and questions now, please. Yes. Um, earlier you said that the current government employment is only 17% of total employment. Is that all? Uh, government agencies, federal. Uh, that's all of them. Uh, in fact, if you look at federal government, it's just it's very, very tiny. It's something like 3%. Uh, but there's an interesting uh, recent book um, by a man named Light, uh, who, who works at, at Brookings of all places. And, uh, and Mr. Light is something of an apologist for, for, for government and, and government employees. But nonetheless, it, it, it's written a very interesting book, uh, and you can actually find it summarized uh, online in some articles uh, he's written, uh, in which he's basically juggled the data to find out how many people really work for the federal government uh, via these uh, relationships as contractors and consultants and uh, recipients of grant funding and what have you. Uh, and uh, he, he was able to pump up federal uh, employment uh, as of a few years ago to 17% from three uh, in a very plausible way. Now, there's a little bit of double counting because in what Mike found is something like uh, three or four uh, of those 17 percentage points are, are people who look as if they're state and local government employees, but in fact they're being funded by federal money. Uh, on these uh, cooperatively funded or administered programs of various sorts. And so they're really federal employees, even though they're getting a check written by the state of Alabama. Uh, so uh, federal employment is much, much bigger uh, than it's uh, formally purported to be. Mark? Uh, Bob, you mentioned at the beginning about your book. It's been out about 15 years now, and there's been some 
more recent work. Um, is there anything in your thoughts about the growth of government changed over that time? That we become more pessimistic or optimistic concerning the growth of government? Um, actually, I want to respond to that differently because uh, the, the question of pessimism and optimism has been raised a lot. In fact, it was raised when the book was first published in 1987. And, and many people, if you can think back to 87, uh, some people were still in the thrall of enthusiasm for, for Reaganism, and they actually believed that Ronald Reagan had somehow changed the course of events and had to turn back the tide of big government, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, I, I, I never believed that myself, and, and I didn't see what happened during the Reagan administration as, as evidence of that uh, at all. Uh, in fact, I thought that uh, all things considered, uh, even under, under Reagan, government was growing in pretty much the same ways and at pretty much the same rate as before Reagan. Now, of course, some particulars are always different, and uh, Reagan did some good things. He got rid of the price controls on on oil and so forth. But he did some bad things too. And if we throw everything into the mix, it seemed to me that nothing fundamental had changed with regard to the growth of government. Certainly government spending was, uh, was very rapid under Reagan. Uh, taxes went up despite the, the first tax cut law and, and so forth. So uh, nonetheless, uh, many people were enthusiastic about Reagan. To my great astonishment, some people still are. And they look back to the Reagan administration as kind of golden age of uh, anti-government. I never understand this. But uh, my book, because it because it didn't recognize that any fundamental change was being made uh, at the time by Thatcher or Reagan, anybody else, or that there was any reason to expect a fundamental change. Uh, was received by some reviewers uh, as, as, as simply an expression of the author's pessimism. Uh, and uh, a number of reviewers wrote about that. They said, well, Hanks is a pessimist. Uh, well, all right, uh, I'm a pessimist. But it's irrelevant whether I'm a pessimist or a raving optimist. What I wanted to do the book to be viewed at was an exercise in analysis and history. Uh, I wanted people to say, this is an argument for why government has grown and why we can expect it to go on growing, including, uh, as I wrote, I believe, in the last paragraph, or the penultimate paragraph, because someday another great crisis will come. And we have every reason to believe that when it does, we will have the same kinds of reactions that we had to the preceding crisis. And government will shoot up again and we'll be off to the races with all the legacies of that particular national emergency. So as long as we have a society with the kind of ideology that ours has, dominant in it, and as long as we have possibility, indeed the great likelihood of periodic crises, there couldn't possibly be a cessation of the continued growth of government. To me, that's an analytical argument. It's not an expression of the fact that Bob Higgs is a pessimist. Uh, and uh, I think some people are given to wishful thinking. Now, I don't beg begrudge them that. I actually envy them. <laughs> uh, Murray Rothbard, whom I love dearly, was an inveterate optimist. No matter how horribly the world seemed to be going, Murray was always convinced that we're going to beat the bastards. Yeah. We'll, we'll win in the end. We'll, we'll come back. We're, we're on the right side of, uh, of events. Well, yes, we're on the right, right side in, uh, in, in various ways. I believe we're morally on side, for example. Uh, and so I'm not deterred by pessimism or by my analysis when I think about how things are going. Uh, I, I would take the positions I take 
uh, with regard to, to my judgments of the rectitude of what government does, regardless of whether government is shrinking, expanding, or what. But uh, what I would hope is that the, the analysis would be what people carry from me. Now, so far as the analysis is concerned, uh, I, I don't believe I have, and I'll finally answer your question directly, I don't believe I've changed uh, any of the fundamentals. I, I do believe that I have more understanding now of some of the uh, some of the interpretations and models and theories uh, that have been advanced by others. I, I think I take some of them much less seriously than I did 16 years ago, uh, so that it's difficult for me to now even discuss them with a straight face. Uh, but uh, I, I was trained and I practiced uh, my profession for many years in, in the context of, of neoclassical economics, and my colleagues there took these ideas seriously. Uh, and uh, I took them seriously too, because I, I couldn't just dismiss them. I had to have a good basis for dismissing them. And, and I think we all should have a good basis for dismissing them. It's a fool's errand to just say you don't like somebody's way of thinking, therefore the hell with it. Uh, we need to understand what's wrong with it. Uh, but I believe I have a better understanding now of what's wrong with some of the standard hypotheses. <coughs> and so in that sense, I, I, I've moved uh, somewhat. Uh, but events have changed uh, in some concrete ways as well. Uh, we, we, by the end of the Cold War, uh, a very fundamental context was changed uh, for the growth of government because the Cold War was a was a very uh, fecund basis for the maintenance and growth of government. Uh, now, of course, the government didn't just roll over and play dead when the when the Soviets, in a very unmanly way just decided to implode uh, without even a holocaust or anything. Uh, 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 yellow bellies. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, of course, the people who benefited from the Cold War and all the things that were tied to it uh, have found new ways. And, uh, of course, the greatest of all recent events is uh, uh, the September 11th attacks, uh, which have been used as the pretext for the mounting of a new permanent war, the war on terrorism, which uh, I never thought uh, anything could be better than the Cold War, but this actually is. Because whereas the, uh, the Soviets could manifestly implode, the terrorists can never just disappear. Because it's in their very nature as terrorists that we don't know who they are or where they are or what they might be doing. So the authorities can always tell us that they have information. Uh, and when they tell the public that, the public will believe. Especially if from time to time a building blows up or a train runs off its rails or something else happens that can be described as the work of the terrorists. Uh, I, I, I suspect, uh, I'll talk about this more on Friday, uh, but it seems to me uh, remarkable what leverage can be obtained from 3,000 deaths. You know, more pedestrians are killed every year in this country, hit by cars while walking on roadsides. Uh, and yet, <clears throat> 3,000 deaths, I'm not minimizing that, it was horrible, uh, 3,000 deaths has been used as the basis for almost revolutionary changes in the nature of government's relationship to American society. I mean, the degree of uh, penetration into people's day-to-day -day lives, of monitoring everyone's emails, of, of uh, listening to everyone's phone calls, potentially giving up entirely several elements of the Bill of Rights, such as the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments, just throwing them out the window willy-nilly. Uh, 
Uh, if you can get that kind of mileage out of uh, two buildings being collapsed by airplanes, then I think you're in business pretty much forever. And I suppose that's a, that's a pessimistic outlook, but that's the conclusion that my analysis leads me to. And I'm prepared to be wrong. I hope to God I am wrong. Uh, but I don't believe today that anything else.